Hi, everyone. George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to another edition of the WIN Educational Webinar Series. Uh, today's webinar is titled A Guide to Navigating Yeast Selection for Different Wine Styles, sponsored by Fermentis. And uh, our presenter today is going to be Ann Flesh. I think you're going to enjoy it. It's a very technical presentation. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, now, as is always the case, we want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. So uh, we pre-record these a couple of days in advance. But the good news is Anne is watching this broadcast right along with you. Uh, she's going to be monitoring the chat room. So as questions come to you, go ahead and submit those questions via the chat, uh, the chat feature. And Anne will pick those questions off as they come in. All right. So please take advantage of that. Uh, I think that about covers it. Once again, I want to thank Fermentis for their sponsorship and their support. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, and Anne, of course, for all she did to put this presentation together. All right, Anne, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, George, for this introduction. Um, so hello, my name is Anne Flesch. Um, I work for Fermentis. I'm the technical sales support manager for the Americas. And today I'm here to talk to you about yeast and most specifically kind of a, a, a guide to understand uh, yeast selection, how to select yeast for different wine styles. So uh, we'll go through general concepts and then we'll look at trials and see to understand a little bit better, help you pretty much uh, make yeast selection uh, a little bit easier uh, when it comes to your wine fermentations this harvest. All right, so um, I'm gonna start just by introducing the company in case you don't know us, who we are in North America, Fermentis. So Fermentis is a business unit of a larger company called Le Saf. Le Saf is um, a French company, French-based company still, but we are present worldwide in terms of production sites, applied science centers, uh, distribution, and we are one of the global key players in fermentation in general uh, when it comes to, of course, beverage fermentation, but also bread making, animal health, uh, pharmaceutical, um, many different um, use of ferments and fermentation solutions. Fermentis specifically now is dedicated to beverage fermentations. And of course, uh, uh, wine, but beer, spirits, other, we have many <clears throat> solutions for different types of fermented beverage. Um, and we have a whole portfolio of products, yeast, yeast derivatives, so nutrients, things like this, uh, selected and developed for winemakers. And we are distributed in North America by uh, our, our distributor ATP Group that is based in, in California, but distributes um, uh, in, in whole North America that has a full catalog of energetical products, equipment, chemicals, and more, and they distribute our, our fermentation solution. So we also have uh, other sub-distributors worldwide, and uh, you know, in, in case distributor and sub-distributor worldwide. So in case you are looking these webinars from other countries, you know, you can always go to our website and you can see uh, where is the closest distributor to you. Still in introduction, uh, just so, so that you understand um, uh, what we do, we have winemakers kind of two categories of product, of course, yeast and active dry yeast, more specifically to ferment efficiently in various different conditions for many different wine styles and to reveal very specific flavors. Uh, and we also have yeast derivative <clears throat> with kind of two different categories of product, either yeast derived product that is gonna help fermentation, uh, fermentation aids, so they can be nutrients or, or different things to increase fermentation performances, or what we call functional products that are more here to enhance, preserve the quality of, of your beverage. Uh, for example, uh, avoid oxidation of your wine or increase color or mouthfeel and so on. Um, in the previous years, uh, we have done um, a couple of webinars about our certification on active dry yeast that's called easy to use. Um, and um, so in case you are interested, I invite you to, to look for these webinars on, on, on the YouTube page. Um, so easy to use is a certification that we have on our yeast that allows to use the yeast in more um, flexible ways. And actually very specifically, I just wanted to, uh, 
quickly introduce it at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, with easy to use, you can inoculate the yeast in more flexible ways. Um, you can either um, choose to direct pitch the yeast and bypass completely rehydration and acclimatization, or you can still choose to rehydrate if you're more comfortable with that um, in water but you can also be more flexible on the temperature of the water going from 15 to 37 um, Celsius. Um, and so uh, in, in either way, it helps you save time and, and make um, yeast use a little bit easier. Um, so if you have questions on this, I again, I invite you to look at uh, uh, last year's webinar. Today, more specifically, like I said, I wanted to give a quick a quick guide about the impact of yeast on wine. And for that, I was kind of thinking, you know, we're gonna go through different categories of how is yeast overall impacting your wine and how each yeast can really take you in different direction of different wine styles. So we'll talk about um, overall the impact of yeast on different things, impact of yeast on varietal aromas from your, your, from your grape, impact of yeast on fermentative aromas, what type of fermentative aromas and how would they result in different wine styles, uh, the impact of yeast on mouthfeel, acidity, on color, on tannin profile. Of course, we also know yeast can be associated with off flavors. Um, so we'll cover a bit of that and advice on how to, to choose yeast to avoid these things and other advice that we can give. Uh, of course, the technical characteristic of a yeast matter too. So you don't just select a yeast that works for the style of wine you're looking for. You also look for a yeast that technically work with your process. And eventually we just conclude about, you know, how to how to make an easy choice. Um, uh, I will use examples from Fermenti's portfolio. Of course, these are advice or things that you can look for in general uh, when, you, when you look for, for yeast um, uh, across the board. All right, so the introduction, we're just gonna talk about just the impact of yeast in general and, and wine styles. It's the importance of yeast. Um, so, if you look in the literature, you can find um, some, some data that yeast uh, it for sure is a flavor engine and is responsible for up to 80% of the aroma, aroma active compounds in wine. Um, of course, it is more true in white and rosé than it is in red, but 80% uh, is a quite important uh, um, uh, percentage. Um, and uh, so if you look at, you know, the different type of aromas that you have in wine, they're usually categorized as the primary aromas that are called varietal aromas that really uh, come from precursors that are in your grape. Um, so such as the thiols, for example, in Sauvignon Blanc or the terpenes in Muscat or floral um, <clears throat> and things like this. Um, the second category of our aromas are fermentative aromas that really come from fermentation, either uh, alcoholic fermentation or malolactic fermentation. In this category, you have, for example, uh, different type of esters of alcohol that import fruitiness or floral character. Um, and then you have the aging aromas uh, that develop during the aging phase. Um, well, what's interesting is that yeast really has very strong impact on both varietal and fermentative aromas. Um, and the choice of yeast, the yeast strain that you you choose will have more or less an impact in the intensity and the profile of esters of thiols that, for example, your yeast can, can release. We also know that it has a strong impact on wine's color, acidity, and tannin profile. Uh, so we'll talk about this also in this webinar. Um, of course, once you've chosen your yeast strain, there are many things that will impact uh, the final uh, profile of, of the wine. Of course, the, the gravity, the, 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 the higher uh, amount, uh, the, the most sugar you have to ferment, usually the most fermentative aromas you will develop. The temperature of the fermentation is very important to drive the yeast um, in a direction or another. And we'll talk a little bit about this during this webinar. The nutrition prof. Uh, the nutrition of the yeast, the program that you have, the type of nutrients uh, that you provide to the yeast, and of course, many other process parameters. So we cannot talk about everything today, but um, these are things to consider. Um, 
wine styles beyond uh, varieties. So um, this is just kind of an overview of uh, what defines uh, most wines. So usually you have kind of three pillars. You have uh, the type of aromas and flavors uh, that you're gonna have in a wine, uh, either the varietal aromas, the type of styles, the type of terpenes is gonna be more on the tropical fruit, on the floral, coming from the grape, the fermentative aromas, again, coming really from the yeast during fermentation. Uh, is it gonna be more uh, complex fruit or maybe very strong uh, strawberry candy, for example? Um, uh, aging aromas and of course, sometimes also some faults, uh, some, uh, some defaults uh, of the wine. Uh, also, you have uh, the palate, the body of the wine um, that can be defined by, you know, if you are I mean, in red wine, the tannin profile, the astringency, the bitterness, um, how much residual sugar, the roundness of the wine, the acidity profile. And finally, you have the visual perception of the wine, where whether it's the color, the color intensity, stability, the viscosity of the wine. And what's interesting really is that the, the yeast can have an impact on most of the things described on this slide. So with the yeast, you can really drive your wine in different styles, whether you are going for a very acid and fresh, white wine with you know a lot of styles or you're going for a very strong tannin uh, tannic red wine with uh you know fresh red fruit and intense color uh yeast can play on all of these aspects um so really of course what does yeast, uh what does yeast do um it's you know uh, from a, a a very simple point of view, uh, yeast uh, ferments the glucose and fructose into ethanol and CO2 through the glycolysis and the fermentation. So that's that's pretty much, you know, fermentation on a very simple basis. Of course, there are a lot of byproducts of fermentation that kind of make your wine taste like your like wine. Uh, so yeast will release a lot of different molecules during fermentation, such as fatty acids, as aldehydes, sulfur compounds, uh, varietal aromas coming from precursors um, in, the, in, in the must, higher alcohol esters, organic acids, and all of this will define, um, will help define your, your wine um, uh, profile, aroma, and, and stuff. Of course, it is you can always take it to a more complex level. And we're not gonna go into the details of this slide, even though I'd love to, uh, but um, this is still a very uh, simplistic overview of what yeast does. Uh, but what we're gonna talk about today is pretty much the two different squares that we have on this slide. We're gonna talk about fermentative aromas and what yeast can provide to wine, either positive, uh, aromas in green esters, acetal esters, higher alcohol that will provide different different type of fruitiness of profile. Of course, also negative aromas, uh, volatile acidity, uh, uh, sulfur of notes, things like this. We'll talk a little bit about these two, and we'll talk also a lot about varietal uh, aromas, thiols, terpenes, and how yeast can impact there, and how what what to look for when you select a yeast for your wine. All right, so let's start with yeast and varietal aromas. So yeast, um, the concept is that your wine has, uh, some wine have more or less aroma precursors that are present in the grape uh, that can be bound to sugar or peptide in, in the juice, in the must. And when they're bound, uh, they're not volatile. That means that you can sense them. And the yeast through enzymatic activity can help release these uh, these, these uh, are, uh, volatiles of, uh, and make them really perceivable uh, in the wine. Um, each yeast is gonna have a different enzymatic pool allowing for different activity, meaning some yeast will really help reveal some precursors and, and some won't. So the precursors that we talk a lot about uh, and you, you probably have heard about are, for example, the thiols. So in the thiols category, you have different molecules. The most well-known are the 4-MMP, the 3-MH and the 3-MHA. Um, 
and um, some uh, most specifically can have a lot of precursor for 4-MMP. And when they are released, they uh, they give box tree, uh, black currant bud. Sometimes some people say cat pee type of profile to wine. 3-MH would be more citrusy grapefruit. 3-MHA uh, uh, more on the passion fruit. So depending on this, you can have very different uh, profile of phthalic wine. Then terpenes, example of molecule in the terpenes category, you have the linalol, the geraniol, the nerol, they give usually some floral citrusy characteristic to the wine. And then you have, for example, C13 orizoprenoid, such as the beta damascemon that gives rose or honey-like and really enhance the wine. So in what type of grapes do you find this type of precursor? So the thiols, uh, they're present in many, many varieties of grape, but the most famous one is Sauvignon Blanc. You also have Colombard, you have uh, red grapes such as Syrah and Grenache. So when you make rosé wine from these, these grapes, uh, you can have quite a lot of precursor for thiols. Terpenes, some of the most emblematic varieties are Muscat, Giverstraminer, Pinot Gris, Riesling, Viognier, going from high intensity to lower intensity of terpenes precursors. Beta damascemon uh, and orizoprenoid, you find it in many varieties uh, that have terpenes as well. And overall, with this type of aromas, um, uh, we recommend uh, um, a temperature fermentation that is usually uh, on the on the higher side for wet wine fermentation but it, because it really helps the yeast enzyme uh, to release these precursors. We have also seen in a lot of our trials the importance of nutrition to release these precursors. Nutrition can have a strong impact and feel free to reach out if you want recommendations. And we can see really that um, you know, this choice is really crucial. And especially for thiols, uh, we we have yeast that have such different profiles. And here I give example in the Safano portfolio, that is Fermenti's portfolio. We have, for example, SH12, that we released a lot of 4MMP, giving really this green thiol, you know, black currant uh, box tree characteristic to a wine. Or if you were to choose a yeast like CKS102, you would rather have the tropical side of the thiol, the, the passion fruit. Um, of course, it depends on the precursors that you have in your wine. Um, for terpenes, you know, uh, yeast like HDT18 will have a really high release of these terpenes, giving these very fresh, citrusy, floral characteristic of wines. So here I give an example of a trial with um, uh, where we compared two strain in our portfolios, SH12 and CKS102, that we both recommend for thiolic wine. But you'll see that they give very, very different profile of, 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 um, of wine. So here it's a Sauvignon Blanc that has quite a lot of precursors uh, for thiols. And we analyze the release of these three types of, of thiols, but also ester production. Uh, between SH12 in yellow and um, SK, uh, uh, CKS 102, and you can see how much CKS of uh, how much SH12 released a lot of 4MMP. So here we express the production of this molecule in OAV, that is other active value. So 10 meaning would mean you are 10 times higher than the average human threshold of perception for this molecule. So really, you can say SH12 should really provide a stronger profile in, in, in these green thiol characteristics uh, versus uh, CKS102 that produces way more um, passion fruit, 3-MHA, but also 3-MH more citrusy passion fruit uh, type of, of, of wines. And here it's another trial, but this one was done in New Zealand on Sauvignon Blanc that kind of confirms, but more on a tasting perspective. We have this PCA where we place a different characteristic of the wines that were analyzed and where the each yeast was positioned uh, based on the tasting. Uh, we have a reference strain, but we really compare the SKS102 and SH12. And indeed, the SKS102, uh, CKS102, sorry, was really perceived as, as citrusy, as round, as fruity, as way more... Um, 
were more in, in intense, maybe tropical, when the SH-12 was more herbaceous, complex, uh, closer to 4 MMP, so very different profile of wine. So it doesn't mean you have to you know, choose one or another, but you have to know that whether you choose this one or that one, you're going to have a very different profile of Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, for terpenes, um, here it's it's a more difficult picture because terpenes uh, uh, are also released uh, by, by the yeast, but you also have more dynamic in the wine. You can have hydrolysis, the terpenes evolve over time, but you can see post-alcoholic fermentation how different the release of terpenes can be between yeast, really going from you know 20 OAV to up to 140 OAV here in a muscat, so very different profile. Um, things evolve and, you know, after time and post bottling, you can have very different profiles. So for terpene, terpenic wine, like Muscat, for example, it's very important to also do trials and look over, over the, the time, the, the, the time of the wine up to bottling, how each yeast can, can perform differently. So here it's very a focus on, on terpenes um, and one specific yeast that we selected for the release of terpene, HDT18, and we compare it to other strains. And you can see here HDT18 really released compared to other strain way more terpenes with also a lot of esters. And in terms of tasting, it really comes out as, you know, a wine here that is a Viognier that has a lot of fruity varietal characteristics. Here, fruity characteristics, but also freshness feeling. So overall, a very varietal wine that really enhanced the terpenes in the wines. All right, yeast and fermentative aromas. So here, we're gonna look up the impact of yeast on fermentative aromas. Um, so yeasts are going to produce different amount and proportion of this this type of aromas. It's very also dependent on the nitrogen content in your mast and, and the nature of this uh, nitrogen. Uh, the main type of aromas that you're gonna hear about are the higher alcohol and the acid esters. Um, these ones, uh, the most famous one are the isoamyl alcohol, 2-phenyl ethyl alcohol, isoamyl acetate, and 2-phenyl ethyl acetate. Uh, they can be strongly aromatic, they impart, uh, you know, banana, candy, strawberry, or very rose, floral. You also have another category that are the ethyl esters. The ethyl esters uh, uh, usually are associated with more complex fruitiness, many different type of fruits, tropical fruit, apple, pear, you know, pineapple, strawberry. And what, what wine styles are they associated with? Higher alcohol and acetate esters um, uh, are usually associated to more strongly fruity aromatic wines toward banana, candy, strawberry, sometimes perfumey. They are very, in, it could be very more intense wine in, in, in um, intensity of aromas. Um, Yeast that, that produce a lot of higher alcohol acid that esters can really enhance or lift neutral wines or rosé wine that are already lacking aromas, and it can also have high vegetal notes. On the other side, yeast that produce a lot of ethyl esters can be used more toward um, uh, um, wine that are more elegant, complex, premium, where you're looking for a more uh, uh, maybe a, a more subtle, but very complex uh, fruity profile, uh, but maybe a little bit less intense, more balanced. Um, again, here, I just give example of strain in Fermenti's portfolio that can really help promote this. We developed an hybrid, a yeast hybrid specifically called HDA54 that has a very high production of higher alcohol and acid esters, and it really helped lift even used on a very small portion of a lot to really lift the aromas in neutral uh, white and rosé um, and also high vegetal notes. On the other hand, um, you know, on ethyl ester side, we also selected these that really help develop this complex fruitiness like the EF85, for example. So that's just to give you an example on Chardonnay of how these behave differently. And we look at higher alcohol, Acetate esters, ethyl esters, different yeast, and look how different the profile is. Again, expressing OIV. You have yeast that really give this higher alcohol acetate esters, intense candy, uh, uh, intense fruitiness. And on the other hand, you have yeast like 
GVS 107 that is way more on the complex fruit that will really give you uh, a more subtle but also uh, more uh, more complex profile in your wine. And whether you are trying to lift the Chardonnay that's really flat and you're trying to make it very aromatic uh, or maybe more uh, complex, you have different options. And of course, it will produce different molecules, but what's interesting for you is to see, you know, how it results in sensory. So this is a trial where we took three very different strains, BCS 103, our most neutral strain in terms of fermentative aromas, HTA 54, really amylic acetate ester strain that I talked about, and EF 85, very elegant and fruity ethyl esters. We analyzed again the production of these esters, and you can see again the EF 85 produces a lot of ethyl esters, um, up to 50 OAV, and the HTA 54 does produce a lot of isoamyl acetate. And how does it result in the wine? Well, for HTA 55, you can see it's very intense aromatically, but a little bit more simple, less vegetal definitely hides vegetal notes, but maybe less complex. EA55, very complex, a little bit less intense, but very floral, very fruity. And again, BCS103, kind of very neutral. All right, so we talked about uh, varietal aromas, we talked about fermentative aromas. Uh, something else um, that this will impact is the acidity and the mouthfeel of your wine. So let's, uh, let's take a closer look. So this is something that when I talk to winemakers, I think a lot of them um, don't know how, how much yeast can impact really the malic acid in your wine. Yeast have the ability to metabolize um, uh, malic acid uh, during fermentation in a very non-negligible amount. It will be very much strain dependent. Um, and uh, it can affect overall uh, if you are going with a wine uh, without malolactic fermentation, it will really impact you know, the acidity profile of your wine. If you are going with malolactic fermentation, yeasts that consume more or less malic acid can help you prevent or help you to start malic uh, MLF if you struggle with it. So uh, it can be a great tool overall for wine styles, but also to manage malolactic fermentation. Um, so here I gave example of yeast strain that we recommend in our portfolio. So for example, a yeast strain that maintain great acidity level would be Safono HDT18 um, and on the opposite or, or uh, uh, VR44 are good options. And on the opposite, you know, we have a lot of this question, um, you know, can I have a yeast that help really reduce malolactic uh, malic acid? And in that case, we tend to recommend BCS103. And here I want to show you a trial to show you the impact of yeast. We have a Chardonnay that starts at 3.7 gram per liter of malic acid. You can see that post-fermentation, uh, all yeast are at least at three or lower. VR44 is at three. It's the one that maintains the most acidity. And then you have VCS103 that's as low as two gram per liter. So huge difference that will really impact overall the acidity of your wine, especially in fresh wine, fresh white and, and, and rosé. Okay, um, yeast will impact the mouthfeel perception of your wine. What you know, um, I think, uh, what you hear a lot about are monoproteins. So yeast will release different molecules and in different amounts that can affect the mouthfeel perception. And each yeast will release and have different effect. Um, so the ones, the, the molecule that you hear the most about are the monoproteins. So they're polysaccharides that are on the outer level, um, uh, outer um, surface of, of the cell wall of the yeast. And through enzymatic activity over time, they will be released in the wine and can really help decrease the astringency, increase the roundness by coating the astringent tannin and overall uh, bringing volume in your wine. Yeast will also release some small protein uh, that can really uh, find the yeast, uh, that can uh, uh, take away from the wine some tannins that can be overly astringent, for example. Um, yeast can also uh, release some small peptides that have been proven to bring what, a sweetness power, really increase the volume and sweetness uh, of your wine. 
And finally, we also have glycerol, for example. So yeast will produce different amount of glycerol and it can help increase the roundness of your wine. Um, through a lot of different trials and also data that we have about our yeast, we can recommend from, you know, yeast that will bring low roundness to high roundness, either in red wines or white wines uh, to really help you target the styles that you want. If you want to make a very round, uh, let's say Chardonnay, and you're looking for something uh, very with a nice mouthfeel, for example, GBS 107, here is a good option. At the opposite, if you're trying to do something more lean, you know, I don't know, SH12, uh, give you more of a, a, a less of a round profile. Same thing with red wine. FV19 is really is that we selected to bring a lot of this roundness, nice mouthfeel in red wine. And we have some options like SG62 that will be uh, uh, way more structure and tannic. So here is an example actually of FB19, uh, where we, I think it's a very interesting slide because here it's a very new strain that we're releasing. And we did 33 different field trials um, to select this strain. And, we can, and in these trials, we compared the strain with 26 different references on the market, and we did an average of the tasting. And you can see the conclusion uh, that FV19 always comes out as more volume roundness, uh, resulting in less astringency, uh, a more global balanced wine, and natural sweetness. So if what you're targeting is, for example, a wine, a red wine, really quick to market, that really has this smooth finish uh, uh, that also helps hide vegetal notes, that's a great option for you. That's an example on whites. You have, for example, on Uni Blanc in France, a very neutral variety, HDA54 versus a control. Again, a yeast that brings a lot of volume, lots of sweetness, lots of balance to the wine. And if that's what you're trying to improve in your wine, that's a great option for you. Here we have a trial on Chardonnay in California. We compare different yeast. And for example, the GVS 107 in comparison to the BCS 103, you can see how much more mouthfeel and body this can help uh, uh, provide to a Chardonnay. So if that's what you're looking for, that's a good option for you. All right, let's talk about yeast color and tannin. And here more specifically, we're gonna talk about uh, red wine. So again, uh, yeast can release and act differently, release different molecules that will affect color and tannin perception in red wine. So for example, again, we're going back to these manoproteins. Uh, the manoproteins are going to be on the outer layer of the yeast. During fermentation, the yeast can release this manoprotein in the wine. Once they are released in the wine, they can really help cook the tannin and anthocyanins. And by doing this, uh, it will really help uh, stabilize the color in the wine and also help the mouthfeel perception. On the opposite, when the manoprotein are not released, they can really absorb uh, um, and rack off the color, the tannin and the anthocyanin from the wine and mellow the color and the tannin profile. Um, we also know that yeast has the ability to produce molecules such as acetaldehyde, pruvic acid, vinylphenol, uh, pyranoandrocyanins that will help produce additional stable pigments. But overall, it's a very complex science. We're still learning about it, but we can definitely rank our yeast at fermentis to say, well, you know, this yeast, for example, will not help you improves the structure, the color, the tannin. But if you go further right, you can have more yeast that will more and more help you really build tannin and color intensity in your wine. Uh, and that is more suitable for long aging red wines or wines, red wines that really lack uh, tannin or color um, in the first place. So in a warm climate that can also very uh, be a great help. That's, for example, uh, um, uh, a trial that we had uh, uh, on Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux in France with the, uh, a partner. And we uh, looked at um, many different strains on, uh, on this Cabernet Sauvignon. And we have here the result of the tasting uh, as a PCA. And uh, we have the different attributes of the wine here. And in red, we have the different strains. And uh, here we have the two axes uh, going up. You have the tannin, tannic intensity. I apologize, it's in French, but I'll try to translate. 
And on the right here, uh, you have more of the quality of the tannin, the roundness, uh, sucrosité, the, the, the sweetness perception, so more soft uh, uh, tannin. And you can see that we have these two hybrids here they are closer to very intense tannin, uh, intense color that can really be great tools uh, if you are trying to build up a structure in your red wine. And then we have FV19 that not only is aromatically very intense and fruity, but also will bring much softer tannins um, for quicker to market um, round profile and red wine. And then we have strains that are, you know, more neutral, way less structure, less body of, of, of a wine that can be a good option if you're really going for a more neutral option. Again, here a trial. Here it's to highlight the hybrid HTS62 that is really an example of a yeast that can be a great tool if you are trying to build structure, uh, re uh, really build uh, tannin intensity for a long aging red wine, for example, and we compare it to two different reference and you can see how, um, uh, how intense uh, the yeast can be in term of, of complexity and also in term of astringency and tannin quantity. Uh, so really a great, this kind of yeast can be a great tool to enhance wine lacking color, lacking stability of the color, lacking tannin and uh, for long aging wines. All right, yeast and off flavors. Uh, we have to talk about this. Yeast can all yeast can have great impact, and depending on the yeast you choose, you, you, you have seen that you can have very different effect. Uh, but unfortunately, yeast can yeast can also provide some off flavors to to your wine. So one of the first first off flavor we're going to talk about is volatile acidity. That um, is, is a production of acetic acid and ethyl acetate. It is indeed very strain dependent. Uh, it can also be produced by other microorganisms, uh, acetic um, uh, bacteria, also lactic bacteria, also some non-sac uh, non can produce a lot of ethyl acetate, but it's also very much condition dependent. So if you treat your yeast well in terms of nutrition and temperature, uh, you can really prevent this. Um, something to consider is that as long as you are at low level of volatile acidity, it can also help you tune a little bit the aromas. A little bit of volatile acidity can make a very fresh ester be perceived maybe more a little bit of a jammy side, jammy version of the same fruit. Um, so here are example of yeast in our portfolio that produce low level of volatile acidity. And I have, of course, a trial to highlight this, uh, but you can see how different uh, the production can be on the strain kind of in the same conditions. So if that's an issue for you and your wine, you know, definitely consider selecting a strain that, that can help um, really, really prevent that resistant strain, uh, such as BCS 103, for example, can really help, you know, uh, prevent production of VA in the first place. All right, now let's talk about sulfur flavors and uh, for uh, mainly the main prime in, in winemaking is going to be the H2S that uh, is usually associated with rotten egg. Um, it's again very much uh, strain dependent. Resistant yeast overall tend to that need low nutrient and, and, and are more uh, resistant tend to produce less H2S in, in general. So VR44, for example, is, is a good choice. But it's dependent on many factors, uh, and a good nutrition program is really key to prevent the production of H2S. For SO2, uh, so yeast produce, uh, produces also SO2. I know it's definitely a trend to produce wine with lower SO2. Uh, it can impart some of flavors that are, you know, uh, for example, like burn match. Uh, so some options, uh, some yeast that we have developed and new hybrids that we developed for the market produces a very low amount of SO2. So for example, HDS62, A54, T18 are very good uh, strain if what you're trying is to produce as low as SO2 as possible in all conditions. So here you can see uh, total SO2 produced on a Chardonnay with different strain. You can see HDS62. And we see whatever the condition, this strain is always very, very low. So different, different uh, yeast, really different uh, abilities. All right, um, now we are trying for sure, we talked a lot about wine styles and uh, overall uh, how each yeast can give you different profile. 
Uh, technical characteristic of the yeast matter too. So I just want to make sure, of course, you also want to select a yeast that will work for your wine. The potential alcohol that you, you have in your wine, you know, want to make sure that the yeast can handle this amount of ethanol. The nutrition need of the yeast, the temperature resistant, the kinetics, whether it is compatible with um, metalactic fermentation and so on. So here is just kind of four examples for stuff uh, a new portfolio, we ranked our yeast from slow fermenter to fast fermenter and how resistant they can be to condition from moderate to strong. So if you're looking for a fast fermenter that can handle, you know, as low as a nutrition program as possible, you're going to want to be on the top part of this chart, BCS 103, VR44, for example. But, you know, um, if you're looking for slower fermenter for, for example, white wine, you know, you're going to want, you know, to look more, you can look in more of the middle of this table. So really want to make sure that, uh, you know, you also take the technical um, mapping of the yeast, the technical information in consideration when selecting yeast. All right, so we arrived to kind of kind of the conclusion you have you know a lot of information about strains and at the end of the day at least at fermentis we try to provide you with quick tools that give you a quick uh, a quick overview of of the portfolio and how to to select strains uh, here is the kind of the make you choice table that we have for white and rosé and you can see uh, it has different dimension uh, how much a yeast is going to improve the sweetness roundness of your wine from low to more to to high how much a yeast is going to have an impact on the varietal aromas and what type of aromas so sh12 thiols uh, GVS 107, terpenes, for example. So whether you're trying to promote these varietal aromas, you're going to want to be on the top of this table. Uh, also, what type of fermentative aromas the yeast is going to provide? If it's an A, it's going to be more amylic, intense. Uh, remember, acid that is the really intense aromas. If it's an F, it's going to be more fruity, ethyl esters, balanced, elegant. So really, this table is made to help you. So let's say you want to make a very round Chardonnay that is, uh, you know, very intense in aromas. CKS 102 is a good option if you're trying to make a round Chardonnay more complex through uh, GVS 107, it's a, is a good option. So really, you, you can ask yourself, you can question and find in the table what is the best option for you. We have the same type of table for red uh, for you know, uh, horizontally, how much a yeast is going to improve the structure, the color, the tannin of your wine from low to high, what type of fruit, fruity profile you can get from, from the yeast, from fresh red fruit up to dark fruit, jammy, ripe fruit on the top, how much a yeast is going to bring you roundness. So HG S135 is a good option if you want to improve the color, improve the tannic profile, but still have a very round finish. Uh, HGS 62, I showed a lot of example about this strain, will actually help you more build a lot of structure, but also with less roundness, really for long aging red wine. FV19, really round profile, uh, but maybe less structure, very quick to market red wine. So really this table is a tool to help you navigate yeast selection, uh, at least with a uh, fermentist um, portfolio. All right, sparkling, of course, we also have option. I didn't talk a lot about sparkling, but whether you are making a very fruit forward sparkling, such as Prosecco, for example, Safano PR for Prosecco 106 is a good option. You see it's a trial on Prosecco, it and you can see the difference with the reference, very uh, intense uh, fruitiness, floral citrus note, really providing a very a fruit forward base wine. If you are making more of a clean and mineral sparkling wine style, such as Champagne, we have another option that's Safanos SPK 105 that will really provide you something, again, very clean mineral, but also providing tools to uh, allow for uh, uh, prise de mousse uh, in a very efficient way. So different options depending on your styles, the target of your styles of your sparkling wine. And we arrive to the conclusion. Um, I hope that in this webinar, uh, you have learned that yeast selection has a very important impact on your wine. 
uh, whether it is on the aromas, the varietal uh, promotion of your wine, the fermentative profile, the type of fruitiness, the mouthfeel, the acidity, the color, the tannin. I want to say we're here to help. I put some contact here of my contact, but also my colleague, uh, Sean Thurman, who is the regional sales manager in California. Feel free to reach out if you have questions, uh, if you need recommendations for your selection. To go further, I invite you also to ask questions about temperature management and nutrition management that are both essential if you want to drive the yeast uh, uh, in the good direction of what you're trying to achieve. And finally, also reach out for uh, recommendation on yeast derivatives, nutrient, functional products. They can really help you uh, uh, even tune up the wine even more, prevent oxidation, increase aromas production, reduce of flavor, stability uh, of color, astring reduce astringency, increase mouthfeel. So many different axes of improvement with yeast derivatives as well. And I thank you so very much for your attention. Feel free to reach out for questions.